there was some confusion. Today's talk um, was going to be the harm reduction one and, and Dr. Maley, I think is best um, posed to give her talk on that. So um, we switched it and we're going to do this buprenorphine talk that was created by Dr. Bott, um, who unfortunately also isn't here today, but I'm happy to, to, to do my best in presenting uh, this information. So we have no disclosures, um, either myself nor the others um, to report. So this is going to review the details of formulation and dosing of buprenorphine. So kind of more the nitty gritty um, details. And the objectives today are to describe the differences between the different formulations that exist, to discuss the difference between the different protocols um, with home-based um, initiation of buprenorphine and clinic-based, to learn about dosing and duration of maintenance treatment, um, which is recommended for people to stay on the medication, along with management um, in the case of, of, of potential diversion, and to create a plan for managing the process of medical withdrawal um, from buprenorphine, if so uh, desired or indicated. So just to touch briefly upon formulations, because there are many, um, this is, you know, a busy, busy slide, but basically showing um, that buprenorphine for formulations for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, uh, so again, with the X waiver um, are both in combination with naloxone, which is more common, um, but also the mono product, so buprenorphine alone. And um, again, the reason why um, it, the naloxone is there is it's not active when taken as prescribed, but it is an anti-diversion um, mechanism in that someone who is opioid tolerant, if they were to inject the combo product, it does prompt withdrawal. And so it is meant more as anti-diversion um, than as a safety mechanism. It's the buprenorphine. This is sometimes a common misconception. Sometimes the, the buprenorphine alone, um, because of what, um, uh, Therese was referring to that ceiling effect um, is, is the safe um, um, aspect of the medication, whether monoproduct or in combination. Um, the sublingual forms come in a film and a tablet, um, and also in um, a buccal form, um, which is uh, less uh, readily available um, to my knowledge. So we're most familiar with using um, the tablet or the sublingual film. And these come in different doses. Most commonly, you'll um, be prescribing or hearing about patients on the eight milligram and two milligram naloxone um, strip or tablet. Um, and um, they do come in other uh, doses, though, and this can be helpful um, when available if, uh, for instance, micro dosing that we're going to go into, if there's smaller doses needed, um, these uh, medications are available from anywhere from a two milligram up to a 12 milligram buprenorphine content. The subsolve, this one here, this just comes up more in terms of insurance. Sometimes this is what is covered. And I would just point out here the equivalent dose column is important because um, even though the subsolve comes in an 8.6 milligram buprenorphine, it's actually the 5.7 milligram buprenorphine um, content that's equivalent to the 8 milligram um, in, the, in the Suboxone uh, brand. So, and then um, you'll also see that there's the sublocade. Um, the, the implant um, was sort of a short trial of that. That's, that's not one that we um, currently use, but the sublocade um, is um, available. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that comes in two doses as a once monthly injection um, and more formulations of that are um, under review. So um, again, the combination product, buprenorphine naloxone, should be used for treatment of opioid use disorder. And as I said, that the naloxone, it's not well absorbed if taken sublingually, so it won't um, cause someone to, um, uh, uh, to withdraw. Um, and really, um, you know, there shouldn't be, if someone's taking it as prescribed, there shouldn't be a difference in terms of like the chance of precipitated withdrawal if they have the combo product or the mono product. Um, it, it's really the naloxone is just there to decrease the injected um, use of this medication. Um, here are the three formulations again of the film tablet and then uh, the um, generic tablet. 
And um, the mono product is really just going to be used because of this diversion potential. Um, it, the mono product is really just going to be used in the case of pregnancy. Um, and we're also seeing um, the combo product um, also used in pregnancy now, but mono product in pregnant women. And if there's an actual documented allergy to naloxone, and this is rare, I will say that I've probably seen an allergy um, once with a clear rash. Um, usually if someone says they have an allergy, you want to tease that out a little bit more because it usually means that they had just taken it too soon and had precipitated withdrawal. Um, and then it's not actually the naloxone, um, but it is important to, to tease that out. So um, do we choose the film or tablet? It's really driven largely by third party consideration. So what's available at the pharmacy, and really what the insurance covers. Um, but occasionally, um, if one has the patient has a preference for one over the other, we can um, try to make a uh, advocate for, for that. The film usually dissolves more quickly in less than five minutes versus 10. Um, and possibly the fact that they're individually wrapped in that um, uh, foil packet um, could reduce diversion or could uh, increase safety risk in the um, chance that um, someone was to get into it um, who, who shouldn't um, access the medication. Um, so in terms of our buprenorphine treatment options, we have um, options to self-administer at home um, and then the injectable, so the long-acting um, sublocade um, form. And you know, the things to consider when the patients are trying to decide between these two are the following. So really the current standard of care is the sublingual form. Um, there's, as we saw, many doses and formulations. It's very accessible um, in most pharmacies. The diversion risk is there because of um, you know, someone having the medication at home. Um, and it has moderate costs, although fortunately, um, um, most insurances will cover this, um, but certainly the cases of self-pay, there's moderate cost to this medication. Um, for an in injectable form, um, this that we don't have as much clinical experience with, although there is a growing number of, um, uh, of uh, doses being um, studied and administration um, weekly versus monthly. Um, the benefit is, of course, it's a closed distribution system, so um, it um, has less risk of diversion. Um, enhanced compliance to the medication, someone has the shot, they are basically going to be treated for that uh, following four weeks um, and have less likelihood of not um, um, benefiting from it on a given day if they didn't take the sublingual form. Um, but it does have higher costs, and this is oftentimes a barrier. So now we'll turn to induction or initiation of this medication at home. And is it feasible to do this at home? When we first learned about buprenorphine, um, I think the focus was really on in-clinic and this study by Josh Lee really um, showed um, the benefit um, and basically the equivalent outcomes of having home induction. Um, it is safe and effective. Um, so this uh, Lee's seven-year outcome uh, study looked at it with an N of 485 people in a setting that was a primary care office based um, public hospital setting. Um, really had similar outcomes to what's been seen in the community with um, in clinic uh, initiation of medication. So at week one, the dropout was 17%. Um, the uh, related induction related adverse events at 12%, however, zero uh, serious adverse events uh, occurred. Uh, precipitated withdrawal also reflected um, the community um, standard prior, so 3%, um, with prolonged uh, withdrawal experience of 4%. And importantly, there is a median treatment retention of 57 weeks, which was, again, um, uh, at, at least as good as the in-clinic inductions and also um, comparable to other treatment retention for other chronic illnesses, such as um, diabetes um, and hypertension. So the process um, for, for selecting patients who um, are, most patients are good candidates for doing home initiation. Um, patients you may consider excluding, patients with low tolerance. I meant to ask Dr. Bada about this. I don't think he meant here um, tolerance of the experience because this last bullet is um, uh, uh, talking about the actual initiation experience. But I think 
Um, if someone has a low tolerance with opioids, um, you would just need to follow a more careful pathway in terms of starting them on the medication. Um, and in certain patients, just to avoid the risk of um, overdose, some patients you may consider that they would benefit from a clinic initiation, but I'll say um, most people do fine um, with starting at home. Patients transitioning from methadone may also um, consider doing a home initiation, but it really is recommended if possible to do it in clinic because those are much trickier um, starts. Patients with cognitive impairments or untreated psychiatric conditions, certainly if there's uh, suicidality, these would all be reasons to um, have someone um, uh, um, monitored while they're going through initiation of the buprenorphine. And then if someone has no prior buprenorphine experience or significant fear of the potential with uh, precipitated withdrawal, um, then it's also, um, if possible, to, to, to at least offer them the experience of, of in-clinic initiation may help them um, through that process. I wouldn't say it's an absolute exclusion, though. Certainly, uh, people can be guided through this, especially if they have support at home. So what do we do in terms of initiation? Um, this is um, uh, kind of the standard approach um, is on day one, you basically telling someone they really need to wait until they're feeling very lousy. So um, really getting into significant withdrawal. They want to wait at least 12 hours since the last use of short acting opioids such as heroin. Um, uh, or at least 24 hours since the last use of long acting opioids such as oxycodone, but the um, the, the rule is really there based on their symptoms, right? So the time frame is important, but they also need to be sure that they are feeling like they're in enough control. Um, sorry, I thought I heard a question. Okay. Um, if there is a question that I'm not noticing, Rana, or a chat, please let me know. Um, so you could consider providing the SOUS for um, the patient, and we'll look at that um, symptomatic opioid withdrawal scale here in a minute, and their target score should be at least 17. Um, and you'd start with uh, typically a four milligram dose. So oftentimes patients, because again, back to those formulation, that formulation side, the eight milligram dose is readily available, um, they'll cut that in half. And then repeat it about every one to two hours if the withdrawal, which it usually will, continue um, for a total dose of 12 to 16 milligrams on day one. And certainly reviewing with them that it's a good idea to call the clinic in the case of precipitated withdrawal so that we can help support them um, through that. This is just an example of that scale um, where it's recommended to, um, to be at at least a 17. And this can sometimes just help guide patients if they have concerns or they're feeling nervous about if it really is the right time. Sometimes having um, something to refer to can be helpful. So you can see this list of symptoms here, basically putting in their words that they're having um, any number of these opioid withdrawal symptoms or cravings. Okay, so that was day one. Then on day two, you'll instruct the patient to take the total that they took on day one in the more uh, of day one in the morning. So in other words, they're not going to keep doing that stepwise approach. Let's say they got up to 16 milligrams on day one. Then on day two, when they wake up, they should just take that total 16 milligrams and contact the clinic to check in. I'll also say it's good if the clinic, um, is perhaps a staff member, um, is available to reach out to them too to check in. That's a that's a a recommended approach. And then um, explaining to them that later in the day, if they continue to experience withdrawal or they're feeling okay for at first, and then the withdrawal sets in again, they can also take an additional four milligram um, until they, they reach uh, a comfortable, and I would say this is probably needing to be updated to a maximum of 24 milligrams. If needed on day three, um, again, um, staying in touch with the clinic is uh, recommended. Um, will adjust their dose based upon their response again. And um, really, in most settings, it's recommended if you can provide a prescription for one week and are able to see them back in one week, um, then they can kind of have the medication there um, that they need. Um, and and if, they, if they had gotten up to that full 24 milligrams, then they would have that each day until they return to your clinic. Um, if, they if they did not need to get up to 24 milligrams, they may have some extra doses. Um, but most, the, most importantly, you want to try to get to this target dose quickly in the first uh, day or two. And then after that, really allowing for the rest of the five to seven days um, to, to let that steady st state occur um, before you increasing further um, if, if you aren't at the maximum dose at that point. 
So again, how long are we waiting? Um, at least 12 hours for short acting, at least 24 hours for most long acting and methadone, we're waiting at least 36 um, to 48 hours. Um, and really important is to discuss ahead of time the possibility of precipitated withdrawal and that we can help treat it. Um, because you know, in most cases, patients, if they wait long enough, they, they can avoid the precipitated withdrawal, but if they're aware, um, that it can occur. And most people at this point are aware and sometimes are kind of frightened by the chance of it happening. So it's a good idea to also explain how we can offer comfort medications um, and get them through it. And we really want them to stay on the buprenorphine in case it, it, it occurs. <clears throat> Um, just to touch upon the transition from methadone, um, what's recommended is being at 40 milligrams or less for at least one week, um, and then no methadone for at least 48 hours. Again, providing those medications for symptomatic management um, is even is even more important, I think, um, in these transitions. Um, so clonidine can kind of help with the internal sort of um, anxious sort of irritability. Um, feeling ibuprofen if it's not contraindicated um, can help with the cramping um, loperamide for loose stools trazodone or hydroxycin can help with the insomnia um, and as with um, our other initiations you can start at four milligrams once in enough withdrawal and then increase as before some in some cases i've seen even a lower dose of two milligrams um, sometimes be um, a good sort of like starting uh, point um, for transitions from methadone just to kind of ease onto it. And what to do with precipitated withdrawal. Again, important to discuss ahead of time so people are aware um, and not taken off guard in the case that it should occur. And if they occur, we don't want to stop the initiation. Uh, we want to provide more buprenorphine. So the idea being um, that it will eventually take over those receptors and have a stronger effect, but the washout for that to occur is going to take a few hours longer. And so really encouraging people to, to stay in touch with the clinic and continue with the plan to stay on it so we don't lose them to treatment. We want to, again, consider those medications for symptomatic management. Um, and if it does happen and patients are able to come into the clinic, um, you know, one option certainly over the phone, but if they're able to come into the clinic, uh, that, that is uh, an excellent um, thing to offer. So what about microdose inductions? We're hearing a lot more about microdosing and macrodosing. Um, and the microdose inductions are really where small buprenorphine doses are administered in a stepwise approach to decrease the risk of precipitate withdrawal and associated pain. Um, and they can be especially useful for patients who are, have chronic pain um, and may be on long acting opioids and they're transitioning off of them. So the next slide kind of looks at that protocol here in a second. Um, or if someone's unable to stop using the opioids during um, their initiation onto the buprenorphine, this may just be the, the approach that is most feasible. It doesn't require withdrawal prior to initiation um, because of its very sort of like gradual stepwise approach that you'll see. And it takes advantage of buprenorphine's higher affinity at the mu opioid receptor. Again, except for fentanyl really, um, Buprenorphine is going to have a stronger affinity, so grab onto that receptor, um, and that that is the reason why if you know if there is a, a, a sort of risk of precipitated withdrawal, then it's going to be very very gradual um, when when the buprenorphine um, uh, dose increases. Yes, uh, thanks, Janet. I see the question there, uh, better affinity than methadone. Yes, and that's why actually um, methadone being a full agonist, it's a great question. Uh, methadone being a full agonist um, uh, and buprenorphine being a partial agonist, again, with that sealing effect, but buprenorphine having a stronger affinity to the receptor, the reason why those methadone to buprenorphine transitions are um, quite tricky is because of the risk of precipitated withdrawal that buprenorphine, if there's methadone on the receptor still, buprenorphine will come along and push it off, but the full agonist then won't be there and you'll have a partial agonist kind of causing that precipitated withdrawal. 
Um, and then after the initiation, the pre-existing opioid is tapered off. So here's that chart kind of looking at this um, otherwise known as the Bernice method, um, where on day one, you're starting with a very small dose. This is what I was referring to with those different formulations. If you have a two milligram strip, you would cut that, that two milligram strip into an eighth essentially, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and have 0.25 milligram on day one. And the patient is continuing on the opioid, right? But starting the buprenorphine over these seven days and gradually increasing it to twice a day, then increasing the dose to 0.5 twice a day, a milligram twice a day. And basically by the end of the week um, at this goal dose of approximately um, uh, of 12 milligrams. And then the, the idea being that then they would stop the uh, prior opioid at that point, and, and the buprenorphine would already be on the receptors, so um, really shouldn't experience withdrawal. Then we'll just talk uh, briefly about maintenance dosing considerations. The FDA maximum is um, 32 milligrams. However, most insurances cover up to 24 milligrams. Um, and, uh, and it's important just to keep track in your clinic of kind of what the doses are that, that you're seeing your patients do well on. Um, there's a lot of this still being studied, especially in the time of fentanyl, what are uh, adequate doses for most patients. Um, in terms of the duration of the prescription, again, that first prescription, if, if it seems appropriate for the patient to have that um, one week um, of the medication at home is, is quite common, um, but it's really tied to how the patient's doing, how you increase it. So there's not like a specific guide for the length of time between visits. It really depends on how they're doing towards their goals, how they're doing working with you in their treatment plan, um, et cetera. So, so you could, one idea to, to follow would be to start with weekly scripts at each visit for four cycles. And then if things seem to be progressing um, well, um, transitioning to two week prescriptions uh, for four cycles, then monthly, then monthly with a refill and really in most um, uh, community settings, uh, if someone's you know just doing fine and very stable a month with two refills, so checking in every three months. As far as diversion management, um, it is important to follow a few um, guidelines here to help decrease the risk of it. Some amount of diversion is going to happen, but um, it uh, can be um, mitigated. And um, we do you know, want, even though usually when this medication is diverted, it's usually people are taking it to help them get through withdrawal, but um, we still want people to be taking the medication as prescribed. Um, so, uh, urine drug screens are recommended at each refill um, and including a check for buprenorphine. And again, it, um, occasionally checking that metabolite is present as well to ensure that it's not, um, you know, just in, in some cases, patients may melt the buprenorphine in the urine and it would show up as positive in a dip, but the metabolite would show that it's being taken appropriately. The PDMP monitoring, we always will check that to um, ch check the uh, prescription monitoring um, program. And then 48 hour callbacks, that's something that our clinic um, does, but may or may not be within the realm of possibility in some settings. But if, if possible, um, patients who are on longer prescriptions, it's part of their sort of treatment um, agreement and consent at first that they understand they may be called at one point um, in the year or every six months perhaps um, to, and they would have 48 hours to return to clinic um, with their medication just to have a, a pill or a film count. Again, not necessary, but may be useful in some settings. Um, and then safe storage, always important to go over lock boxes, keeping the medication stored up high and away from others. And um, just, uh, we'll just conclude with a uh, few slides um, regarding the high potency um, synthetic opioids, namely uh, fentanyl. Um, many people are doing okay with these initiations from fentanyl. However, there's really increasing reports of precipitated withdrawal. And I think as came up in a question last week, we're really seeing a big variety in terms of patient experience and kind of what we do as providers. Um, we do see um, the study showing that uh, the treatment retention um, and staying off of uh, the uh, opioids uh, seems to be equivalent um, uh, for heroin versus fentanyl once stabilized on buprenorphine. Why is there more precipitated withdrawal with fentanyl? Um, some thoughts, not fully understood, but some thoughts are reduced renal clearance, that it is a lipophilic drug, so it could be stored more in fat stores and more long acting over time. Interestingly, it's not seen 
seen, uh, precipitated withdrawal not seen when a fentanyl patch is replaced with a buprenorphine patch, which can be helpful in the uh, pain management transitions. Um, again, just touching upon the microdose approach, one idea to help patients um, avoid precipitate withdrawal when coming off of the synthetic opioid is starting low and going slow. So waiting until they're in, uh, waiting longer into withdrawal. So waiting, you know, 24, 48 hours, so kind of more along the, the methadone angle, um, aiming for a higher initial opioid withdrawal scale. Um, so over 13 to 15, the SOUS, which was the one for the home monitoring was 17. This is the clinical opioid scale, which traditionally we would use as um, for our short acting or non synthetic opioids, we would say wait until you're at least eight with fentanyl it's recommended really to wait until at least 13 to 15. Um, self report less reliable so again just kind of making sure someone has backup on the scale and then provides you know the counseling education about what to do in the case of of withdrawal provide those adjunct medications and then just kind of having a slower initiation approach. So starting at one to two milligrams and aiming to get up um, so a little bit slower, um, but they may need to build up to that total dose of 24 milligrams. And then just remembering that some may need methadone that this approach um, or the next approach that we'll describe the macro dose may not work and to just um, uh, be aware that methadone might be what's gonna um, be needed at that point for the patient if they can't make the, that transition. Um, this is looking at a case study, a case series of four patients in which two um, received uh, the sort of traditional approach for starting um, buprenorphine um, and patients who were on fentanyl starting, and then two um, were, were given this sort of that microdose that uh, I just described, um, the multiple two milligram doses um, uh, had uh, improved outcomes, again, pretty small N, but um, we need a growing body of evidence uh, for what, what are best uh, practices. And then this will conclude, I think, um, on the macrodose approach. Um, and um, this, interestingly, was a study um, looking at five individuals who, um, you know, over the course of two to three days had an induction um, to high dose buprenorphine and actually transitioning by, by day three over to the sublocade, so that long acting 300 milligram buprenorphine monthly injection. And interestingly, these patients by day four, their cow scale, you know, had gone um, uh, essentially to zero and um, they received the um, uh, three buprenorphine um, injections um, over 12 weeks and um, had good results in terms of retention and treatment and decreased heroin um, use. This macrodose approach, interestingly, was the one-day induction. Um, it says here in preparation, but I think this did come out last year by Mariani, um, so it's a good um, uh, a study to look at also a, a small smaller study um, again at the end of five but these individuals got up to their buprenorphine um, uh, sublingual injection uh, sorry sublingual injection sublocade um, injection not sublingual injection um, by day one and then um, did very well um, as well over 12 weeks with retention and treatment um, um, over that period of time so um, Again, there's a lot that needs to be studied um, uh, still. Um, we, we're still trying to gather information to inform best practices. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought that was a little bit more just about withdrawal management. Um, I think we're okay, Rana, right? Just to take a couple more minutes, okay. Um, so as far as how long should someone stay on the medication, that's oftentimes patients first concern. There's no data to, um, okay, thanks, Julie. There's no data to provide guidance on how long to treat, um, but really we know that there's high relapse rates when someone withdraws from the medications and the studies as long as 16 weeks show this. Um, and uh, we really, so we are, are understanding is clear that these brief withdrawal periods are unlikely to result in long-term um, uh, abstinence from opioid use. Um, and patients, uh, this uh, study, um, which I think has been in a couple of other presentations, um, which showed that long-term um, retention um, 
is 75% uh, with one year maintenance. And really what we wanna do is keep people in treatment um, to, to prevent um, relapse and subsequent um, possible overdose. So really we wanna continue someone on the medication as long as they're benefiting from treatment. So when the patient asks for really how long they should be on it, I try to reframe the conversation to not in terms of time, um, but more in terms of how they're meeting their goals. Are they, is the, is the benefit greater than the risk of staying on the medication? So goals such as other, you know, are they staying away from other substances, you know, what their goal may be there. Um, employment, um, having stable sort of family, um, social um, ties, all of that can really um, inform someone's sense of stability and, um, and readiness if they do decide that they're going to taper off um, more so than a, a specific time frame. Um, and really, we see no difference. Um, the, the studies are clear um, in the length of a taper. So um, in terms of advantage for um, staying off of, of opioids, but we do know that there's a high relapse rate regardless um, of the length. And also important to remember that the risk of an overdose is greater after withdrawal because of that loss of tolerance. And so um, if someone's undergoing a medical withdrawal, if they've decided to move forward that they really need to have a, a clear understanding and informed uh, uh, understanding of, of the risk of that. Um, and again, if withdrawal is done, it should really be um, once those functional goals are met, there's more stable social networks um, gradually or at the patient's own pace. Again, no evidence that one pace is more helpful than another um, and really encourage them to remain engaged in treatment and therapy if, if, if they're amenable to that. And then considering a naltrexone injection after um, completing withdrawal and being off of the medication um, there may be some benefit to that in terms of helping um, someone um, prevent a relapse. And with that, I will stop the 